I'm Todd Jones, recovering from 30 years as a sports writer. Thanks for joining me as I sit down with some of the best sports writers of our time. We knew the greatest athletes and coaches and experienced firsthand some of the biggest sports moments of the past half century. We'll share stories behind the stories, some we've only told each other. Pull up a seat on Press Box Access. There's an old adage, write what you know. Bill Cook knows Cincinnati. Knows that River City better than any sports writer. It's his hometown, where he covered sports for more than 40 years. Bill will share a lot of great tales about the Queen City, especially University of Cincinnati basketball and football. We'll talk a lot of Bob Huggins. A Hall of Fame coach is the subject of Bill's new book, Hugs. Check it out and get yourself a beer and a chili cheese coney. That's how they roll in the 513. Bill, it's good to belly up to the bar with you once again. Been a while, Todd. I don't, we don't get to do it as often as we used to with you in Columbus. That's right. It's like we're in Hyde's Lanes back there where your dad <laughs> used to take you after games yes, at Crosley Field, right. right on the west side of Cincinnati. Yep. You know, I think about it, Bill. We met 35 years ago. It was the summer of 1987. I was a college intern at the Cincinnati Post, scared shitless. Yeah. I had grown up reading the Post, and I walked into the newsroom, and oh my God, there's Bill Cook. Oh, come on. <laughs> I'm dead serious. Come on. <laughs> that's hard to believe. I just could not believe it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's a true true memory of my own. Well, I, I, I grew up in the Cincinnati era, but you grew up in the west side of Cincinnati, and you ended up writing sports there for like 40 years, Cincinnati Post, Cincinnati Inquirer. Um, when you think about covering sports in your hometown, what was it like when you look back on it? Well, uh, it was hard and it was easy in a way. I mean, I had to, I, I was a huge sports fan as a kid, obviously, and I grew up following the Reds and UC basketball. And I ended up covering UC basketball as a beat guy. So I had to, I had to learn to put my fandom up on the shelf for the whole time of my career. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't really hard for me, but I remember uh, Bob Huggins used to tell me I'd gone too far the other way. I was too negative, <laughs> but, um, yeah. but I, I was always very cognizant of that and really careful to not be a homer and to and to be as critical and and never take the easy way out. And if, I, if there was a story to pursue, I, I would just I knew I had to pursue it. That was my job, and so that's what I did. So it was a little weird that way. There was some fandom in there, but I had to just put it put it aside. And now that I'm retired, I can be more of a fan again, which is actually kind of fun. Right, right. Did it also give you an understanding of the readers that you were writing for? Uh, the fact that you grew up there and you knew what they were into? Yeah, to an extent. I mean, this whole the whole Pete Rose thing was difficult for Cincinnatians to, to, uh, to accept because Pete was such a beloved figure, especially on the West Side. Right. So uh, we didn't want to believe it, but obviously it was all true and, and he's not the model human being that we thought he was. And uh, But I understood that. I understood, like, I remember when... Uh, Pete's son came up for the majors, I don't know, for mm -hmm. a game or two, and he, he was playing third base. And he took his toe and he, he drew a circle and he put his dad's number in there, number 14. Do you remember oh, yeah. that? And mm -hmm. uh, or either that or he wrote 4192. I can't remember what it was, but that was very emotional for, for fans. And I, I remember some of the guys in the press box were like making fun of it, you know, while the fans were getting so a oh, big ovation and everything. But for me, I understood it. And I actually wrote my column about that, about what that meant to Cincinnati people to see Pete Jr. do that. Right. Yeah, I think I was there that day too. And it was yeah. emotional. Because yeah, if was. you knew Cincinnati, you knew what Pete meant to that Absolutely. city. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, war warts and all. Well, Bill, you covered so many things. World Series, Final Fours, All-Star Games, Sydney Olympics. You also have written five books. Uh, I have not even written a coloring book. So you're setting a <laughs> wicked pace on me with that. Um, your latest book is uh, Hugs. Former players talk about what it was like to play for Hall of Fame coach Bob Huggins. Nobody knows Hugs better than you. Uh, you covered the University of Cincinnati sports for so many years. We're going to talk a lot about Hugs, but I want to ask you a quick one. Didn't he once play you one-on-one -on -one basketball? <laughs> he did. Uh, I'm still shocked that he did that. I don't know another Division One coach in the country who would have agreed to do that. I was a columnist at the time. I was not the beat guy. And uh, our sports editor, Mike Bass, suggested that I ask Hugs to play one-on-one -on -one against me, and then we, we, I'd write a column about it. So I went up at the end of practice one day, and I just sat down, and I said, look, I know you're probably not going to want to do this, but they want me to ask you to play me a game of one-on-one -on -one so I can write a column about it. And all he said was, <laughs> we'll, play, we'll play make it, take it to 10, and you won't score. And when the day came, 
I remember going up into the basketball office and I said, you know, I got my little work at basketball clothes on and told the secretary, I'm here for a one-on-one game. And she called back to his office and a couple seconds later, he comes bounding down the hall. He's got his little gym shorts on and his, his tube socks from the seventies. And he goes, <laughs> come on, let's get this ass kicking over with. And out we go to the gym. And you know, we were the only two people in the gym, except for a post photographer, Mel Greer. Yeah, the great Mel Greer. So he scored, he just backed me down. He was bigger and stronger than I was. And he scored like the first four baskets. And I thought, no, he really is going to shut me out. But then he, you know, he wasn't in the best of shape. This was before his heart attack. I didn't know he had a bad heart. <laughs> so I, uh, I went outside and I, I couldn't score inside. So I sh- I'm not a very good shooter. You've seen me play. And I made a three-pointer, and he just kind of ignored it. And then I made another one, and now all of a sudden it's like four to two. And now I'm thinking, oh, this is, now we got a game. And then he started getting serious. Right, right. And he started taking me inside, and I could tell the intensity level was, was going up. And he, one point there was a ball got knocked. Uh, somebody knocked away the ball at going for a rebound. It was going out of bounds. We both were running after it full speed, and, and I got it. And I heard him go, shit. <laughs> and like, that made me feel good. <laughs> <laughs> You were getting to him. <laughs> yeah. So finally he beats me 10-6. And we walk over to the sideline. There's a table there. And he's leaning over the table. And he's breathing really hard. And he says, man, he goes, I'm too old for this shit. I can't do this anymore. And then he goes, 10-5, right? And I said, no, it was 10-6. He says, your ass, it was 10-5. I said, well, you can tell everybody it was 10-5, but it's going to be 10-6 in the paper. And that's what it was. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> he was trying to cut you out of a basket. Yeah, he was. You know? yeah. <laughs> well, I've seen you play, and you're a good player. I can attest in days of playing cove ball with other scribes and friends, and, and also can attest that you know Cincinnati and know how to write and report and did it so well for so many years. Uh, let's go back to the early days of your career in July of 1982. Um, for the first time, you get sent to cover the Cincinnati Reds, the team you followed Ooh. when you were growing up. Yeah. And... Uh, I think the beat writer, the great Earl Lawson, um, I think he took a week off or a few days off. And so they send you to St. Louis. And this is 1982, and this is not the big red machine. No. This is a team that lost 101 games. And Johnny Bench was playing third base, of all things. Right. What do you remember about being sent there for the very first time as a young scribe to cover the Reds on the road? Well, talk about being scared to death. I was a high school reporter, and I, had no, I, I didn't know how to cover a Major League Baseball team. And I just came into the office one day and our sports editor, Doug Henry, said, hey, we need you to go to St. Louis and pick up the Reds. It was after the All-Star break. And the reason Earl, Earl didn't want to go because it gets hot in St. Louis in July. He just mm-hmm. didn't want to go. And uh, <laughs> Veteran. He'd been there. He'd been there enough times. <laughs> he hadn't been through that. So, so I went and I uh, got on a plane the next day and I really was scared. I remember going into to the clubhouse. I didn't know anybody. I didn't, there was Hal McCoy and there was Tim Sullivan from the Inquirer. I forget who else was there. And all hell was breaking loose. I mean, John McNamara, the manager, was cussing everybody out. And Johnny Bench <laughs> stormed away. He wouldn't talk to anybody. And I'm going like, geez, what's going on here? Is this how this always is? Because I grew up reading Earl where everybody, players were always happily chiming in with great quotes and yeah. everything, like one big happy family. I wasn't expecting oh, yeah. this. Yeah. Right. And uh, so I basically did what any smart young reporter would do is I followed Hal McCoy around, followed him around the clubhouse and got quotes from uh, – very to Ron Oster. What happened was Dick Wagner, the general manager and president, had ordered McNamara to bench Johnny Bench and bench another guy, Wayne Krenchicki, who he was playing third at the time. Bench had, had started the season trying to play third and he couldn't do it. So he was he was mad about that. He was near the end of his career. Mm-hmm. Next year he retired. They called up a kid from AAA named Tommy Lawless. They put him at second and they moved Ron Oster from second to third. So, so the general manager made this happen. Right. Now, no one was saying that. I took a leap of faith and just assumed that. Oh, hell yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so my lead was something like uh, Res President Dick Wagner might be pulling a Charlie Finley. Charlie Finley was the owner of the A's, Oakland A's at the time, who was famous for telling his manager what to do. <laughs> and I didn't, you know, I wrote it and I said, well, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know if I did a good job on this or not. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> the next day I walk in a clubhouse and Marty Brenneman, the Reds Hall of Fame radio announcer, calls me aside and says, son, come here a second. And I said, yeah. And he goes, did you really call Dick Wagner a Charlie Finley? And I thought, oh man, I shouldn't have done that. And he goes, I got to tell you, son, that's strong. That took some guts. <laughs> so I was, I was all proud of myself. 
And then, then uh, Sunday morning, it was a weekend series, Sunday morning in my hotel room, the phone rings, and it's KMOX radio, 50,000 watt clear channel station. They want to interview me about the Reds. And I said, well... Yeah, I mean, you're such a veteran. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. That's such a national figure. I said, well, I don't really cover the Reds. You know, I, I'm not the guy to talk to. And he goes, oh, we don't care. You know, they don't care. They just want somebody on the air. And he said, we usually call Earl Lawson when he's here, but since he's not, we're going to ask you to do it. So I go on there and I hold forth about the state of the Reds for about five minutes. I go back into the clubhouse and here comes Marty again. So let me ask you something. I said, yeah, how long have you been covering this club? I said, I don't know, two days. And he goes, and you think that gives you the right to go on a 50,000 watt clear channel station and talk <laughs> about the state of this club? And I like, so I went from way up here to way down there real fast. Marty made sure of that. <laughs> well, Mar Marty could put you in your place, right? Oh, man, could he ever. <laughs> well, you covered the game in 1985 on September 11th when Pete Rose broke Ty Cobb's uh, all-time hit record with hit for 41.92. What was it like to be there as a reporter in the stadium for that historic moment? Well, in a way, it was kind of anticlimactic because, you know, you knew he was going to get it eventually. What was cool what was was leading up to it, a couple of weeks leading up to it, when Pete would, he would do a press conference before every game and after every game. He would bring his bat in with him. Wow. And he would answer reporters' questions for like a half hour every day. And he would give <laughs> great stuff. I don't know, that's why the writers loved him so much. He was, he was amazing. I don't know how he could do that and still focus. Mm -hmm. But the series right before he broke the record, the Reds were in Chicago at Wrigley Field. And he wasn't going to play. Remember, he was a player manager there. So Pete wasn't going to play that day because of the pitcher. And then when, they, when the Cubs unexpectedly changed pitchers, put, Pete put himself into the lineup. And so he was going to play. So he, had, he needed just one hit to break the record. And he came up to bat. They didn't have lights at Wrigley then. It was like the dusk was settling on the stadium and Everybody's saying, oh, man, if he gets this hit, we're going to be working all night. This is it. Right. And there was a lot of nervousness in there. But he didn't. I think he grounded the ball up the middle, but he got, somebody fielded it and threw him out. So that was, uh, that was more nerve-wracking than when he actually got the hit. Uh, right. I do remember in the, in the press box after he got the hit that uh, two of our writers got in a big argument about <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was funny. Really? There were two, two guys with real big egos. Yeah, they got into a big argument, and I started yeah. laughing. <clears throat> do we, uh, do we care, to, to care to reveal some names here, Bill? I'll be happy to. <laughs> One was the beat writer, Bruce Schoenfeld, and the other was the columnist, mm -hmm. Jay Mariotti. You know those guys. And, okay, uh, so they went at it. They went at it because Jay said something to Bruce like, you know we need to talk to Eric Schau. Like, he didn't know that. And so that Bruce goes, Jay, I know who I need to talk to. And then they started yelling back and forth at each other. And then I started laughing and then they turned on me. <laughs> Scribe battles were always yeah, the best. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was certainly an historic moment, not because of the scribe fight, but because of the hit by Pete Rose. Well, I remember uh, before, be, before that, like, I remember when Pete got his 4,000th hit and he was in River, he was at Cincinnati. He was trying to get his 4,000th. This was a very touching moment, I thought. Dayton Daily News has have, have a writer named Cy Burek, mm -hmm. who had been there for Hall of Famer. Know, yeah. 50 years, or some Hall of Famer. So everybody's down there th thinking he's going to get his 4,000th hit. Well, he didn't get it, and then, and then he was with the Expos, and they had to leave to go to Montreal. And uh, so he comes into the post-game press conference, and he walks past Cy Burek, and he pauses, and he, and he says, sorry, Cy, I really wanted to get it while you were here. I just thought that was really cool that, that, wow. that he was aware of that and he, and he wanted to do that for Cy Burek. And then he, wow. he got it in Montreal like the next day, I think. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So that was an historic moment when Pete breaks the record. And it's funny, the Reds actually took you to another historic moment in a much different way in 1995 in October. You were with the Reds. You were in Los <laughs> Angeles to cover yeah. the Reds and the Dodgers yeah. NL Division Series game. You're staying in a hotel downtown Los Angeles and lo and behold, the O.J. Simpson verdict is going to come down. Right. <laughs> Can you tell us what happened? Well, I woke up in the morning. I put the TV news on, and they said the, the verdict is going to be, you're going to announce the verdict at 11 o'clock or whatever it was. And I, and I thought, and that, that's pretty cool that I'm here, because you remember what a big thing that was. Right. And I thought, it would be pretty cool to be there when that happens. I wasn't the columnist, though. I was just like the sidebar guy. So I called Joe Posnanski, who was a columnist, and I, I asked him, I said, are you planning on going to that? And he said, no. So I called the paper and I asked them if they wanted me to go. And they said, yeah, that'd be great. So I literally, I walked there. It was like a 20, 25 minute walk. I remember it was really hot. Mm -hmm. and there was this big circus of people outside the criminal courts building and a lot of media, but 
also just a lot of, uh, you know, people selling refreshments and it almost like looked like a circus <laughs> and people were, you know, I would interview somebody and then somebody would come up to me and, and interview me thinking that I was a, I was an OJ fan or I, I had a stake in the trial and I'd say, no, nah, you don't want to talk to me. And <laughs> remember my wife told me later how, how worried she was that I was going to get caught in a riot if I was there. Um, uh, but the verdict came down and of course he was, he was not guilty and everybody, not everybody, but there's some cheered and some were upset. People were all gathered around radios and little portable TVs. And, uh, it was just, it was just kind of a, a spectacle, really cool thing to witness. Uh, the way people, I interviewed some people who were talking about, you know, some who they were sure that he was guilty and, uh, they had dreams about OJ and that's how they know he was guilty, stuff <laughs> like that. Hmm. So it's something I'm really glad I did, though, because it, it made for a good column. And it's just like I can always tell people I was there when the verdict was read. Yeah, sometimes it's like you're in a place and you don't expect something to happen. And lo and behold, yeah. look what happens. And you're at the at the foot of history and something dramatic. And yeah. it has nothing to do with really sports, but you just happen to be there because your sports job took you there. So, But I, I wondered uh, often what would have happened if he had been guilty. Hmm. If there really would have been a riot, and I w really would have regretted being there, <laughs> yeah. But it, but it didn't work out that way. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. You know, sometimes sports, uh, it's it takes you to crazy moments. Sometimes it takes you to the crazy type of ideas or stories. One time you were covering tennis, the ATP tennis tournament in Mason, Ohio, near Cincinnati. You decided to ask Andre Agassi something that had nothing to do with tennis. What did you <laughs> ask him? I asked him about going bald. About what? how much how much it bothered him when he went bald, <laughs> because as you can see, I have the same problem. But when, when you cover a major tennis tournament like that, you just can't pull somebody aside and ask them, "Hey, I got, you got a few minutes," because it doesn't work that way. You have to set up interviews outside the press conference. I didn't want to ask him during a press conference because I didn't want right. to take away from other writers who were really had matches to cover. She had set up an interview with Andre Agassi in the players' lounge, I guess it was, and. Mm -hmm. So I asked her if she minded if I piggybacked on that. And she said, I, I don't care. So I went in there with her and she gets done with Agassi. And I said, hey, Andre, if you got a second, I just got one more quick thing I want to ask you. And he says, okay. And I said, look, I'm, I'm not trying to be a smart ass here. I'm really not trying to be a jerk. I really wonder about this. I said, how did you deal with going bald? And he started talking about it. Like, like I started going bald when I was 18. I always knew I was going to go bald. My Everybody in my family's bald and I took. I tried various ways to hide it and different ways to to express myself or ways to cover it up. And uh, finally, I just said to hell with it and shaved everything off. And he said it was one of the most liberating things I've ever done. <laughs> I maybe talked to him for like three or four minutes tops, but it made a great call. <laughs> I mean, this is the image is everything guy, you know? Yeah, exactly. And he's not exactly. afraid to talk about being bald. I love image it. is everything with the long flowing locks. Remember? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah. Maybe well, they he were was, implants. I don't he know. He was great about it. I, I was, I was really surprised. I thought he would just tell me to get the hell out and, and you know, well, and stalk off, but he didn't. He sat there and answered the questions. You know, sometimes the athletes and coaches would surprise you. You know, you'd ask them something yep. totally unrelated to what they normally do, and it was almost yep. like a relief to them to talk yeah, about something else. Exactly. Sometimes they like it. You know, Andre was a guy who who liked the spotlight. He was out there in commercials and everything else. But there are also athletes and coaches who didn't really like it and very reclusive. And one of those was the great legendary pitcher, Sandy Koufax. Right. And you happened to get one of those rare one-on-one -on -one interviews with Koufax. Um, can you tell us how that came about? Well, Koufax had just been the subject like a couple of weeks earlier of a, a Sports Illustrated article. And it, basically the thrust of the article was that he was kind of a, a reclusive guy who kept to himself and didn't want to talk to anybody and almost made him out to be like a hermit. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd heard that he was coming to UC to uh, attend a fundraiser for the baseball team. Right. Ed Jucker, who was his baseball coach and basketball coach. See, well, I should back up. Koufax came to UC on a basketball scholarship. While he was there, he heard that the baseball team was going to take a trip to New Orleans in the spring. So he decided, I'd like to make that trip. So he went to Jucker, who was his basketball coach. Jucker was also the baseball coach back then and said he wanted to try out for the baseball team. So Jucker took him into this old building. You may remember it sits up overlooks Nippert Stadium called Smidlap, Smidlap Hall. It was a, there was a gym in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, he went in there and threw for, for Ed Jucker. And, and Jucker couldn't believe what he was seeing. Like, Koufax couldn't get the ball over, but he was throwing it so hard. Jucker had never seen anybody. So he made the team. And then obviously, yeah. he, we know what he did after that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So he came back for the fundraiser. He knew Ed Jucker was sick. He was, he was seriously ill. 
And he, he had this great reverence for Jucker from, for what he did for him hmm. uh, when he was at UC. So I knew he was there. It was, it was a basketball game. He was just sitting up in the president's box. And so I went up there, I think it was at halftime, knocked on the door. And I said, is, is Koufax in there? And whoever answered, I don't remember. They said, yeah. And I said, well, can I come in and talk to him? And I'm, yeah, they knew who I was. And he said, well, I'll go ask him just a second. He comes back and he said, yeah. He says, come on in. Hmm. So, okay. So I got my little tape recorder in my notebook and I sit down. I'm a little nervous and start to ask questions and put on my tape recorder. But my tape recorder wasn't, wouldn't work for some reason. So I keep banging on and like, why, why won't this thing work? <laughs> so finally I shut it off and I, th- and I start taking notes and Kofex says, got to do it the old fashioned way, huh? And I said, yeah, <laughs> I guess I do. <laughs> but he was, uh, he was a perfect gentleman, man. He was, he couldn't have been nicer. He even, he even referenced the Sports Illustrated story. He said, yeah, they made me out to be some kind of a kook. Do you think I'm a kook? I said, no, I don't think so. But he talked about the love and reverence he had for Jucker and uh, how mm-hmm. important it was for him to be there for that, how he wouldn't have missed it. And then he left, you know, maybe 10 minutes before the game ended. And he got up and gave Jucker a big hug. And it was obvious that he kind of knew it was the last time he was ever going to see him. I think Jucker died the following year. So uh, that, that right. was pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah, Koufax being a basketball player in college, uh, people don't know that, but he he loves basketball so much that he goes to the Final Four every year. Oh, I didn't know that. I covered probably a dozen Final Fours, and several times I saw him there. And he would be sitting in the front row behind one of the baskets. In one of the Final Fours in New Orleans, I was on the media bus riding over to like the Saturday games in the Mm -hmm. afternoon. And I look down, and there's this guy walking down the street all by himself <laughs> with the fans. And then I'm yeah. like, oh, my God, that's Sandy Koufax. Yeah. And yeah. he was just walking by himself. And I think he almost he had like an aura about him that people were almost like, maybe they were intimidated or didn't yeah, recognize yeah. him. He's not yeah. that big of a guy. But everybody knew that he didn't really talk to the media. So he just kind of, you know, went about his own way. And, yeah. uh, and it was interesting to see him in that environment because, you know, he's such a— he was the Hall of Fame pitcher for the Dodgers, and yet here, here he is at the Final Four right. just enjoying the basketball. I thought that was really interesting. Well, it's odd to think about Sandy Koufax, the basketball player, and it's also uh, kind of odd to see the University of Cincinnati football team being in the college football playoff, which they were in January, and they become a national program. And I just feel like if you grew up in Cincinnati when I did and when you did, Bill, I mean, the Bearcats from 1951 to 1997 – Never even played in a bowl game. No. And they were so bad in the 80s. It's, it's, all right, let's think about this. You started covering UC football and you're in the 80s. And it's 1991. <laughs> you're at Penn State yeah. versus Cincinnati. Cincinnati loses 81 to nothing. I yeah. mean, talk about putting the L in debacle. 81 nothing. What the hell was it like to cover a game where a team loses 81 to nothing? Uh, Joe Paterno really tried not to make that, not to let that happen. I mean, he had his third oh, string on, players come in on, there. It was 81. <laughs> he tried. He, he had his, he had his like walk ons, everybody, but UC was so bad. <laughs> it was, it was in the early days of Tim Murphy's era at UC. Right. And when Tim got there in 1989, they only had like, I don't know, 60 scholarship players or something like that because they were on probation. And he re- literally had to build it from nothing. That's people forget about him and the work he did. Yeah, and he got it up to the point where he finally went eight and three, and then he left and went to Harvard. And I believe he's still at Harvard. Mm-hmm. But um, it, it was just so bad. I mean, I remember in the post game, I, I believe Paterno even apologized for it afterwards. <laughs> and I remember Murphy saying he doesn't need to apologize. There's nothing he could have done about it. That's how bad we are. <laughs> Something like that. I remember. I remember they were played in Miami, Florida once, and they lost fifty six to nothing. And my friend Tom Gresham, who was covering for the Inquirer, he said something like, uh, what's it like when, uh, when the Miami guys put in their second string and they're still beating your team that bad? And, and Murphy goes, they're second string. They're still all high school All-Americans. We're like, we don't have any of those guys. <laughs> but he, he did an amazing job of turning that thing around. And then each coach kind of made it better. Well, that's what I mean. You go from 81 to nothing at Penn State in 1991. And 17 years later, you're covering the Orange Bowl. And then a year later, the Sugar Bowl, and the Bearcats mm-hmm. are running out onto the field to yeah. play Florida. And uh, Did it feel like you were in a different universe when you it saw did. that? Absolutely, starting with Brian Kelly. I mean, Brian Kelly came in right away. He said, we're going to, this press conference, introductory press conference, he says, we're going to throw the ball around. We're going to have some fun. And I could, you could tell right away that this guy was different. He really believed this stuff, and he did it. Um, 
He was a he was a joy to cover, by the way, Brian. I love Brian Kelly. Why did he electrify the program? What was it about him? He had a magnetism about him and a confidence that he could talk players into doing things they didn't think they could do. Hmm. Like uh, Connor Barwin was a was a came as a tight end before his I think it was his senior year. Brian Kelly called him in and told him he wanted him to switch to defense. He wanted him to be a defensive end. Connor didn't want to do that. But Kelly told him if he did it, he'd, he'd end up in the NFL one day, which he did. He ended up, I believe he was a second-round draft pick, played for like 10 years. Right. And uh, he just convinced him that he had all the tools to do it. I remember Connor told me, like, he just talked me into it. And I walked out of his office thinking, oh, yeah, I can do this. And like, like, at one time he had a guy, I think his name was Demetrius Jones. He was a quarterback at Notre Dame, and he, he had some problems at Notre Dame, and he transferred to Cincinnati. So that was a big deal, Notre Dame quarterback coming to Cincinnati. But right. it was obvious early on that there was something wrong with his shoulder. He couldn't throw the way he had when he was in high school. So Kelly puts him at linebacker. Now, he doesn't like that. I remember at spring practice one time, Kelly tells us he's switching Demetrius Jones to linebacker. I go to Demetrius and I said, how do you feel about playing linebacker? He says, well, uh, I don't mind. I'll try it. He goes, coach told me if I want to go back to quarterback, I just let him know and I can go back to quarterback. So I went back to Brian Kelly and I said, Brian, he... He says he can play quarterback whenever he wants. And Brian says, he's a linebacker. Go back and tell him he either plays linebacker or he plays another sport. <laughs> <laughs> no question who was calling the shots there. <laughs> no, no question. <laughs> well, Brian Kelly, uh, you know, certainly proved his worth as a coach. He went on to great success at Notre Dame. And, and now he's down at LSU with his family as he likes to right. say now. Uh, right. But, you know, his big personality really did, you know, uplift a program that had come so far. And when you think about big personalities in Cincinnati sports, they don't come any bigger than Bob Huggins. And yeah. really, he kind of came in in similar circumstances in the late 80s um, when he arrived. Um, well, what was Cincinnati basketball like in 1980s when you were covering it compared to what it was in the early 60s when they were winning national championships? Well, Huggins came in the same year as Tim Murphy, and, and both programs were on probation. Um, the whole athletic department was a mess. The basketball program in the early 60s, of course, was one of the best in the country. It was two straight national championships and just missed a third uh, when they lost to Loyola Chicago in overtime. Mm -hmm. They would have been the first school, even before UCLA, to win three in a row. And this is after they had Oscar Robertson, the great big Right, it was right. after Oscar, right. yeah. So it went steadily downhill from there. Maybe not steadily. I mean, it wasn't terrible right away, but by the, by the 80s, that was really struggling, and Tony Yates became the head coach. Tony was a point guard in the national championship team, mm -hmm. so that was a big deal when they hired right. him. He had been an assistant in Illinois, but Tony really wasn't much of a head coach. He just didn't, you know, his practices were very disorganized, and sometimes he was late for them. He, he liked to battle with the media. He hated me. All right, well, give us, give us something about how he hated you. Well, well the, I remember going up there to do a— just an innocent little season preview, like the middle of October, the season getting ready to start. Mm -hmm. And I set my tape recorder on his desk. I'm doing that so I don't misquote him. And he turns around and opens his desk drawer and pulls out another tape recorder and sets it on his desk. And he says, if you're going to tape me, I'm going to tape you. <laughs> and I went, okay. He's okay. going Richard Nixon on you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. That's fine. I used to, I was uh, young and aggressive and I didn't really care what I wrote. I, I wrote some pretty scathing things. If I, I look back now at some of the stuff I wrote, I probably would have hated me too if I were him. <laughs> but I mean, I don't, I don't regret any of them. And I mean, they were all true. I don't think I was unfair, but I didn't hold anything back. When I think of the Tony Yates era, I think of six words. Look out, <laughs> Lou's got a board. What does that mean? Tell the audience what that means. It was, Shoemaker Center, which is now Fifth Third Arena, was under construction next door. Lou Banks was uh, a very good player on that team. And he got into an argument one day with Cedric Glover, a big 6'8", 250-pound center. Mm -hmm. And they got in a fight and uh, rolling around in the locker room. And it, so anyway, they go out for practice. They're on the floor. And Lou goes out to the construction site and grabs a board with nails in it. And he comes back in and he goes after Cedric Glover. Now, I didn't see this happen. I heard about it from a student manager. And he said, and some one of the assistant coaches <laughs> yelled out, here it comes, uh, look out, Lou's got a board. <laughs> And so they, they stopped him before he could do any damage. And I heard this story from a manager, and I kind of sat on it for a while. And then finally, one of my editor said, you need to confirm that and write it. So I did. I talked to several players, and they said, yeah, it happened. Well, it turns out I wrote it the day of what turned out to be Tony's last regular season game at UC, probably his last game, period. 
He had just won. They had won three out of four games. They had a winning record. They had beaten Louisville. They had upset Louisville. So he thought he was coming back. Yeah, and then the Grim Reaper shows up. That's you. <laughs> yeah, then I showed up at practice at Cincinnati Gardens where they played before the new arena was ready. And I waited for Tom Gresham, my competitor, to leave. And I said, Tony, I got to ask you about something. Because I had to ask him about it. And so I told him I was going to write this story. And he got so mad. He started pacing up and down. And he, Tony was getting really mad, really agitated. And I started, feel, I was a little afraid he was going to come after me. Mm. So I just left. And I wrote the story. And uh, the next day, the athletic director, a real hard-ass guy, Rick Taylor, he sees me at the game. And he says, uh, I really wish you hadn't written that story. And I said, why is that? And he goes, because it's going to make it look like when I do what I'm going to do next week, that that's the reason why I did it. Mm -hmm. And then the next week, he fired Tony. A few days later, actually, he fired Tony. That was a sad end to, uh, you know, a guy, again, he was a point guard on the yeah. national championship teams, and it just didn't work out. He wasn't, no. wasn't a coach that could do it. But a guy who could do it was his successor, oh, Bob man. Huggins. What a difference. Who comes in in 1989. You know, the thing about Huggins at that time is, you know, he was still young. He wasn't well known. He was only like 36 years old when he took over. Uh, how soon did you know that this was the guy who was going to get this turned around? Like the first five minutes of his first practice. Really? I, I've told this story many times. Tom Gresham and I were at his first practice. They were going up and down the floor. One of his players got knocked down. His name was Orlando Williams, and he's laying around, laying on the floor, and Tony yelled at, or uh, Huggs yelled at him. He said, Orlando, get your ass up. He goes, they're not going to stop the game for you if you get knocked down, and we're not going to stop practice either. Hmm. So Orlando, like, scrambled to his feet, and there, all the players went, whoa. And uh, you could just tell. I, I can't remember if I looked at Tom, or he looked at me. One of us said, wow, this guy can coach. We knew right away it was different. His mm -hmm. His whole presence was different. His demands were different. He, he, and he told his players from the start, they, they were on probation still then, and he only had eight scholarship players. And, but he told the seniors, he said, this isn't going to be a five-year re rebuilding phase. You and I, well, we're going we're gonna to win right now. Because right. It wouldn't be fair for me to tell you guys it's going to be, your, your senior year is going to be wasted. We're going to win right now. And they did. They went to the NIT his first two years. Mm -hmm. And then third year, they're in the Final Four. Uh, it, it was yeah. just an amazing turnaround. That that team, that 92 team, is so beloved in Cincinnati, and rightfully so. When I think about that team, I, I think about it a team as a team that took on the identity of its coach. It had talent, but it had fire in its belly. How do you recall that 92 team? Well, they were they were all junior college guys, mostly junior college guys. And so, you know, there, a lot of national writers were writing that uh, there was a renegade program and you can't build a team this fast and you can't do it with all junior college guys. Mm -hmm. And some of them got, you know, they, they had some brushes with the law as years went by, but they're good guys. I mean, I've gotten to know them and they've always treated me really well. Right. And to this day, if I, whenever I see them, they go out of their way to say hi to me. They were a lot of fun. They had a lot of personality and they did have their personality of, the co of their coach because they knew how good they were. Mm -hmm. And for them to go to the Final Four was no surprise to them at all. They were just, they, they were going to go out and kick ass and, and take no prisoners. And, and that's what they did. I mean, they were, they were amazing. And, and when you said about being surprised, when they beat Memphis for the fourth time that year in the regional final, and they beat them by like 30 points. And remember, we were walking back towards the locker rooms after the game, and Tom Gresham turned to me and said, you and I are the two most surprised guys in this arena, aren't we? And I said, yeah. Because <laughs> we, we used to go to NCAA tournament games to cover them, you know, just for the paper right. uh, when we didn't have a team in them. And we'd, we'd come back and say, God, we look at those teams in that tournament, and we look at UC, like, UC's never going to be that good. And then they were, there they were three years later in the Final Four. And, and yeah. Great players. I mean, Anthony Anthony Buford, Herb Jones, Nick Van Axel, yep. Corey Blount. Just great players yep. and uh, and got it done. Yeah, they sure did. So many of those players have great have told great stories in your in your new book about Huggins uh, called Hugs. Um, there's a lot of stories about Bob. Do you have a favorite Bob Huggins story? Here's here's one that comes to mind. He had a player named Darnell Burton, who uh, ex outstanding shooter, mm -hmm. and uh, he got suspended. But they wouldn't say why. They just said it was violating team rules. So found out the reason was he had been te he had tested positive for marijuana. And uh, but the guy who told me was just one source, and they, I wasn't allowed to write it just on one anonymous source. So I was in Hugs's office one day, right? And I said, uh, "Oh, by the way, Bob, I know why Darnell was suspended." And he goes, "Well, you better be damn sure 
if you're going to write that, you better be sure that, that you're right. And I said, well, I'm sure of it. And he, he goes, why do you think it was? And I said, because he tested positive for marijuana. And Hux goes, well, God damn it, Bill. Every professor on this campus smokes pot every weekend. No one says a word about that. And then I thought, well, there's my second source. <laughs> yeah, right. You just confirmed it. <laughs> and he was, and Huggins was probably right, too. <laughs> yeah, he was. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, when I think of Hugs, I think of uh, five letters. Yeah. I don't know if that's a... I don't know if that's a story you're allowed to tell. I don't know. You can tell a sanitized version of it. Go ahead. Let's. Well, we might have to edit the tape, but go ahead. So you want me to tell it the real way? Yes, let's hear it. Well, I heard this story from an assistant coach. We were in Puerto Rico. We were. Coming, I was on riding on the team bus coming back from a game, and he says to me, "Have you ever heard the DMF Hall of Fame story?" And I said, "No." So he tells me a story, and it's um, it has to do with Melvin Levitt, a uh, really good player. Good guy, Melvin. Too, Melvin. Yeah. yeah, yeah, really good guy. Melvin apparently dropped the course like in spring quarter, and it dropped him below 12 hours, which would have made him ineligible for a scholarship. He wouldn't have been a full-time student. So Hugs finds out about it, and he goes through the system and gets, gets him put back in another course. And then he calls, he calls all his players together for a team meeting in the, in the players' lounge in Fifth Third Arena. And on the walls are these giant team pictures of all of Hugs' players down through the years at, at UC. And he starts pacing up and down the, in the room, telling everybody what a stupid thing that was for Mel to do and how you guys are so stupid. I can't believe I got to clean up after you guys like this. And he wheels around to Melvin and he goes, Melvin, you, are you really, I'm really allowed to say this. Go ahead. <laughs> he says, Melvin, you're a dumb motherfucker. He goes, you may be the dumbest motherfucker who's ever come through this school and look around you. You're in a dumb motherfucker hall of fame. <laughs> <laughs> so I heard this story, you know, I didn't really know if it was true. I mean, somebody told it to me, but, but I spread the story around among sports writers, as you know. It's legendary. I was, in, uh, I was in L.A. one time, and UC was playing UCLA, I don't know, 2016 or something like that. Right. And Mark Wicker comes up to me from the Orange County Register, and he, he goes, hey, Bill, he says, I'm just curious, any guys on this team in the DMF Hall of Fame? <laughs> like, he knew about it. <laughs> so when I wrote the book, I won't really wanted to use that story, but I didn't think I could use it unless I knew for sure that it was true. So I got done near, near the end of my interview with Melvin, and I said, look, Mel, i got to ask you about this. I said, I want to preface this by telling you that my daughter knows this story, and she loves it. She thinks it's really funny, but I've always wondered if this is really true. And he goes, well, he says, there was a time when I dropped the course. He says, I wasn't going to just let it like that. I was going to get back in another one, but he found out before I could do that. And sure enough, that led to Dumb Motherfucker Hall of Fame. <laughs> I said, so it's true? And he goes, yeah, you can tell your daughter it's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've just told our audience it's true, too. So thank you con for confirming it. It's one of the one of my favorite sports writers. <laughs> It's fantastic. And we actually have it on tape now. Yeah. So I yeah. love it. I love it. You know, Huggins, Hall of Fame coach, great coach, obviously, and a character. And really, in the early 90s, Cincinnati was such a hotbed of college basketball, you know, yeah. with characters. I mean, it, it's a weird city in that you've got Kentucky fans right across the river, and Rick Pitino had it rolling down in Kentucky. And then across town in Cincinnati, had Pete Gillen and later Skip Prosser at Xavier. Uh, they had it rolling. And then you had Huggins had it rolling. I mean, you had all these people just clashing. And, and, and when I think about uh, rivalries in sports, I think about Xavier versus Cincinnati. Now, there's a lot of great rivalries. Right. But what is it about Xavier versus Cincinnati that makes it such a special rivalry? Well, they're so close to each other. It's literally like just a couple miles. Mm-hmm. Um, and Xavier has always been the, it's not like Duke and North Carolina where they've always both been great programs and both national programs. Xavier was terrible. I mean, they were worse than UC, even in UC's bad years. Right. So um, they just, they, they have this David and Goliath thing where Xavier really takes great joy in beating UC whenever they can. Right. And, uh, and they just hate each other. The fans, the Xavier fans really, really hate UC. I think more even than UC hates Xavier, but maybe I'm overstating that, but. You know, the famous handshake game where yeah. Hugs wasn't a big fan of, he wasn't a big fan of Pete Gillen either. And uh, Well, let's set the scene, Bill. Let's okay. set the scene. I'm covering Xavier for the Cincinnati Post. Yeah. You're covering Cincinnati for the Cincinnati Post. We're sitting basically together courtside. It's January 19th, 1994. Xavier wins a hard-fought game in the old Cincinnati Gardens. What a great barn. Yeah. Remember that place? Yeah, it's not there feet anymore. Would stick to the feet would stick to the floor yeah. from you know stale beer mm -hmm. and smelled like cigars. 
Xavier wins 82-76 in front of a raucous, sold-out crowd. The coaches walk toward each other to do the usual post-game handshake. And what happened? Well, Hugs wouldn't shake Gillen's hand. And so Gillen just got furious. Hugs just started to walk away. And I, I remember this. Maybe you have a different memory, but I remember Gillen walking off the floor. His face was all red. He was walking off with his assistants, and he was like, literally almost spitting. He was so mad. I don't know what he was saying, but he like, screw that guy, I know screw what he that was guy. Saying. Something like that. What yeah. was he? Is that what he was he saying? He was saying, fuck him. Yeah, fuck yeah, him. yeah, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and so we get in the post-game press conference then, and I remember I asked Hugs, why wouldn't you shake Gillen's hand? And he just, he, he goes, Bill, I'm not a phony. And I, I asked him again, I asked him like three or four different ways. And every time he would just go, I'm not a phony. I'm not a phony. And then I found out later, according to Hugs, one of the Xavier assistant coaches was yelling at Hugs during the game, like just sit down and shut up and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So Hugs wouldn't shake Gillen's hand. They've made up since then, though. They're good buddies again now. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, they had a, a really contentious relationship because they were battling over turf and, and attention and success in the same city. Uh, you know, I, I, it made for great storytelling. Oh, yeah. I mean, there was always something going on. And, you know, people thought that if you covered one team, you were with them or something. But I didn't care. I just thought yeah. it was great, great fun well, to be around because I love college basketball and the personalities made it such that uh, there was always something happening. Yeah, and there was, there was also the... Uh, Xavier had this image that they liked to, to promote of being uh, choir boys and we graduate all our players and we never do anything wrong. And that used to really get under Huggins' skin because Huggins was always portrayed as a guy with a black hat mm-hmm. and Gillen and Xavier were always you know, lily white. They never did anything wrong. Mm-hmm. And that used to really tick him off. So that, that was always underlying there. But then when Skip Prosser came along, Huggins loved him. They yeah. got along great because he, in Huggins' perception anyway, Skip didn't play that card, mm-hmm. and he was more genuine. Now, and I love Pete Gillen. I, I think that I covered Gillen his first year at Xavier. Um, but Hugs just couldn't abide that, what he perceived as that. He thought there was a, a genuine phoniness to that. Yeah, I like I liked Pete, too. Uh, I covered him a few years, and he was always great to deal with. Yeah. Um, he, you know, he, he, had a bit of a, uh, he had a bit of a character that he played, and you didn't really get to know him as well personally mm. but skip prosser was just Very you know genuine. you knew who you're dealing yeah. with and um and and skip is probably one of the most beloved coaches that i ever covered in terms of people yeah. i don't i never heard anybody say a bad word about skip he was just a good guy and obviously you know tragic when he died at such a young age of, of a heart attack uh, miss him do you remember when uh, shortly after he died you and i and a couple other writers got together and uh, what was the name of the the pub he used to go to in Hyde Park? We went there and we, we met there and drank a toast to him. Oh yeah, the Irish skip. pub, yeah, Haps Irish pub Haps, or something right. like that. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's how good of a guy he was. Right, right. Well, the Xavier uh, Cincinnati thing is uh, such a heated, heated thing, and you know I think one of the things that. Cincinnati was able to do was they were able to get themselves on the brink of a national championship. They almost won it in '92. They got to the Final Four. They had a great team again in '93 lost a tough regional final in overtime to Carolina. And then in 2000, they had the best team in the country and the best player in the country, Kenyon Martin. And um, they were going to be the number one seed. That that just looked like a team that was going to finally win that national championship that Cincinnati fans have been waiting for since the early 60s. And then you're at the Pyramid, the pyramid in Memphis, and you're at a (laughs) Conference USA game, a meaningless game. It's a strange place. Yeah. And Kenyon Martin breaks his leg and... When you're, you're sitting courtside. Did you realize what happened at the time that no, was that serious? I mean, you see a guy go down like that, and you you never you never think the worst right away because most of the time they get back up and they either play again or they go to the bench for a while. They come back in, or maybe they miss a game or two. But um, this was this was something quite different. And they had they, it was the first game their first game in the tournament, and they were playing St. Louis, a team they had beaten by forty points like a week earlier. Mm-hmm. And Kenyon goes down. And he knew right away that he had broken his leg. And Hugs comes out, and Kenyon tells him, he starts apologizing. And Kenyon, he was told me later, he said he kept saying, no, no, not now, not now, this can't be happening. And Hugs tried to calm him down like he did for Deshaun Bryant in West Virginia years later oh, yeah. when, when he right. tore his ACL. Um, and I, re- I remember, you know, the, it was like the air was out of the balloon. They, there's no way they should lose to St. Louis. And uh, I remember they took Kenyon to the hospital, and then he came back, and he was... He was in the locker room after the game, and he had his leg propped up on a bench, and he was doing interviews in there. And he was hmm. he sat there and talked 
answered every question that anybody, he, he never said, I, I don't want to talk anymore. He just sat there and kept answering mm-hmm. questions. And he kept saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be with these guys the rest of the way. We're still going to win the national championship. Well, they, they won their next game against North Carolina Wilmington, I think it was. And then they, they lost to Tulsa. But they were so good that I remember thinking, well, you know, maybe they can still make a run. They still got a lot of good players, and Hugs is a really good coach. Maybe they can just reinvent mm-hmm. themselves. They had uh, Dermar Johnson, who was a lottery pick that same year that, that uh, Kenyon was, but it's right. just they didn't have any time. You know, they only had a couple of days to, like, reinvent everything they were doing, and so it just didn't work out. It was sad. Yeah. You, you, think about, you think about Kenyon, you know, sitting there answering those questions. I, I, I think about him... Um, you know how far he came as a player, but also as a person. You know, when he first got to UC, I mean, he was so quiet and shy. He, he, he was scared. He really wouldn't talk much at all. And yeah, by time he by time he left, um, he he was a leader. He was a total leader and, and the best player in the country. He, and I think that showed uh, another side of what Huggins did as a coach is that he brought these guys along, you know, and I think sometimes that gets overlooked. You just think about basketball and and uh, Kenyon Martin is a representative of, of what Huggins did for players. That's a big part of what my book is about. Uh, every, almost every one of those guys swears their allegiance to Huggins because of what he did for them, not just as basketball players, but in other ways. Like, they had a player, Terrence Gibson, who was on the Final Four team. He was Huggs' first mm-hmm. recruit at UC. He wasn't a highly recruited guy. And, right. You know, he wasn't a great shooter, but he played really hard, and he hustled and uh, played good defense. And... Uh, Hugs asked him one time, what, what do you want to get out of this? Like, you know, he, he knew he wasn't going to play in the NBA. And he said, I know this because this is in the book. And Terrence said, well, I want to be able to someday get a good, a good paying job so I can support my family. He was from Dothan, Alabama. He didn't have any money. You know, he was very poor. Mm-hmm. And right. years later, Terrence told me he was sitting in Huggins' basement in Loveland in uh, a New Year's Eve party. And he said everybody had gone to bed, and it was just me and Hugs were sitting there. And Hugs said to him, Terrence, uh, let me ask you something. He says, when, when you first came here and I asked you what you wanted to do, did, did you want to, you said you wanted a good paying job. Hugs said, did, did I uh, uphold my part of that bargain? And Terrence said to him, Coach, you did more than you, than you even told me you would do. He said, you, you held a, upheld your part of the bargain and more. Terrence works for a uh, JTM meets. He's been working for him for like 40 years. You know, he's a grandfather. He lives in the area. Mm -hmm. And when Huggins got his DUI, they made him, they had to go to a press conference and he he was suspended. They announced his suspension. And he had to read a statement. And I I remember looking in the back of the room and there was Terrence Gibson and Corey Blunt, two of the players from his Final Four team. And I I asked Terrence when I interviewed him for this book, I said, why was it important for you? To, why did you go to that press conference? And he st- he was driving in his car while I was talking to him, and he, he started crying. And he, he apologized. He said, well, I, I'm sorry I'm crying. I'm sorry I'm getting all emotional, but this is how I get when I talk about coach. He says, I was there because I love that guy, and I love what he did for my life. And if anybody ever says anything bad about him, they better not say, him, say it around me. Hmm. That's the kind of allegiance he has to those guys, from those guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that gets overlooked. I mean, sometimes a guy like Huggins, they, they, they take on this national image. It's almost like a cartoon character. Yeah. You know, people generalize to the point where it's like they don't even see all the different complexity that we're all, we're all complex. We all have different layers right. to us. Um, you know, but from afar, you know, you're just, oh, this fire-breathing dragon guy and he's hard to deal with. But, but you spent all those years around you know, and you got to know him, especially in the early days, right? I mean, you would talk to, talk to Bob every day, right? I would, I would go up Every day, say practice at three, I'd go up around two and I'd walk back to his office and I'd knock on the door. It was always dark in there. He always had the blinds closed and, and he would get most, most for me to come in and I would sit on a couch like right in front of his desk and we would just talk for like 45 minutes or so. Sometimes uh, about stories I was writing, but sometimes we would just talk. And then when it was time for practice, I'd walk out with him and we'd walk to practice and, uh, and I could talk to, it's not like it is today, I could talk to whoever I wanted to. I didn't have to set up an right. appointment or anything. I would just wait for the players to come out. And it was great. And, like, we talked about all kinds of stuff. And, you know, he's, he's just, he's a, he is a very complex guy. I mean, after he had his heart attack, a year later, I did a story, like, one year, looking back uh, on the one-year anniversary of it. And uh, I asked him at the end of the interview something like, uh, why do you think this happened or why do you think you survived? And he said, he said I think, God had a plan for me. He says, I don't know what it is, but I think he has a plan for me. Hmm. And I thought, 
come on, <laughs> like, you know, cynical scribe. <laughs> but I think he really believes that. And I think he really, he really, it's, he has a very rough way to go going about it, a lot of rough edges, but he really believes that coaching, a big part of coaching is improving those guys' lives. And he, he can't stand for those guys to throw away a chance. Like he had guys want to come to him and quit. Almost all of them at some point would come to him and quit. He'd talk, talk them out of it. Like he had a player named Terry Nelson, one of the California guys on the Final Four team who wanted to be a comedian. Mm-hmm. And he actually did some stand up like in, on the open mic nights in California. And he went to tell Hugs he was leaving. And Hugs says, Well, Terry, what are you going to do? And Terry said, I'm going to go back and do stand up. And Hugs said, Terry, you're not that funny. <laughs> and, and then he said, Don't be one of those guys who that goes back to, goes back home and then sits in the park drinking, uh, Cold 45s, more liquor, and talk about how the white man screwed you over. Don't be one of those guys. And Terry mm-hmm. said, well, I went back to my room and I thought about it. And he was right. And so he, he just sucked it up and, and figured it out. There was so much more going on than just basketball. And I think that gets lost sometimes. Yeah. You know, it sounds like all philosophical and kind of way out there, but it's, it's true. I mean, when you're around a program as much as you were around Cincinnati's program all those years from really the mid-80s mm-hmm. through to like 2014, you, you got to see another side that, you know, maybe you don't see if you're looking at it from the outside. And, uh, and so many of those great stories are in your book, Hugs. I, I recommend that everybody check it out. It's, it's, it's a great read. There's a lot of fun stuff in there and a lot of wisdom too. And, um, Huggins is 16 years at Cincinnati. I know, you know, they stand out to me as, as he's one of those personalities that I feel fortunate to be around somewhat in my own career, and, and nobody knows Huggins quite like you do, Bill. Yeah, I, I realized as I was writing this book that um, those years of covering Huggins, a lot of times it was a pain. I mean, he could be hard to deal with, but for the most part, he was pretty cooperative. It's only when he perceived that, that you were messing with him or that you crossed him. Mm-hmm. Uh, by, and by that, he could mean if you were just doing your job. But um, I also realize now, as I look back on it, those are probably the best years of my career covering him, mm-hmm. what he did at that program. and the way the city embraced him and how fun he was to cover every day. Those are really interesting times. Like one, one time he was at West Virginia and I was still at the, at the Enquirer and I, I called him up. UC was going down to play there like two days from then. And he was living in a hotel down there because his house wasn't ready yet. He was living up on a suite above top floor. And so I just said to him, are you going to be in the hotel bar tomorrow night, night before the game? And he said, no, nah, I don't think so. When I get down there, I drive through a snowstorm to get there and I, Check into my room. I go down to the bar to get something to eat and something to drink and sit in there talking to UC's SID. And in walks Huggins with his friend Chuck Machock and he, a whole, you know, three or four other guys. And they all sit down at a table and he comes over to me and he puts his arm around me and he goes, Hey, man, he goes, We had some good times together, didn't we? And I thought, <laughs> Yeah, I don't know how good they were for me <laughs> all the time, but, <laughs> but, but, uh, but now that I think about it, they, they were good times. They were, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, it's great that we ended in a bar uh, <laughs> because that's where we've been here yeah. in a virtual bar. Uh, the bar lights are coming up, unfortunately. I think it's closing time. So I'm going to have to take the tab for you, Bill. Um, you know, thanks a lot for uh, you taking the time to join us. Uh, I, I, again, recommend everybody read Bill's new book, Hugs. And um, I do want to thank you personally for all the advice, laughter, and friendship that you've shown me over the years. It's it's been a real pleasure reminiscing with you today. Thanks, Todd. I really enjoyed it a lot, and it's been great knowing you, too. Thanks for listening to Press Box Access. You can find us here with a new episode every other Wednesday. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe and follow us on Apple Podcasts or on your favorite podcast app. We'd love for you to review us. Five stars would be nice. Follow us on social media. Drop us an email at pressboxaccess at gmail.com. And be sure to spread the word. Everyone is welcome here. This has been a production of Evergreen Podcast. A special thank you to executive producers Michael D'Aloya and Gerardo Orlando, producer Bill Hoffman, and our audio engineer Nathan Corson. I'm your host, Todd Jones. It's closing time. Rock on. Women's Running Stories, where we explore the intersection between running and life. Because every woman who is committed to a running journey has a story to tell, and this is where you'll find those stories. 
I am host and producer Cherie Louise Turner. I'm a 53-year-old runner, and together with original music by musician and runner Cormac O'Regan, we bring these inspirational stories to life. Please join us to fuel your adventures.